morning. Happy Sunday. Uh, at this time, we invite you to be in a posture of worship, so you may stand or remain seated, and we're going to kick things off with You Are. The kids will come up for a few moments together. Come on, come on, come on. Have a seat. Have a seat. I found it. Good morning. Hey, everybody. It's good to see you. All of you. All of you, all of you. Good morning. All right, that's fine. Good morning. Good to see everybody. Everybody good today? Yeah. Good, good. So, you know, every Sunday morning that we can't have worship. Well, we could have worship, but our worship is made so much better because of these people back here. You see these people? So, so the thing, though, is that they are doing something we need to do too okay they are sharing their gifts with us and God so Mr. Garrett has the gift of playing piano and singing as does Miss Shannon she plays the piano and sings and Mr. Terry back there he has the gift of playing guitar, uh, bass guitar I bet you can you play guitar too oh yeah yeah <laughs> and then we have 
pa- uh, this is actually Pastor Jim. He's a pastor too, and he has the gift of playing guitar. And Miss Tiffany has the gift of singing. And usually Miss Amy O's here too, right? We all know Miss Amy O. And I have Miss Deb, who has a very special gift. <laughs> Talking about yourself. <laughs> that she, what does she do? What is she doing? Sign language. Sign language. Isn't that neat? Isn't that a really neat gift? Where do these gifts come from? Who gives them? God gives them. And do you think that all of you have gifts? Some of you have the gifts of singing or playing an instrument or or gymnastics or dance. I believe in that too. I know you do. So do you think you could use your gifts and skills and talents to honor God? Do y'all think you could do that? Yeah, so it's really important that when we we use our oh, can I have eyes and ears right here? It's really important that we use the gifts that God has given us to honor God, right? Yeah? All right. So as you think about that this week, I want you to be sure that you take a moment to say, thank you, God, for giving me the ability to do back bends or to do the floss as we dance, right? Right? Okay. Can you guys pray with me? Repeat after me. Dear God. Thank you you. for our gifts. gifts. Help us us to use them to to honor you. you. In Jesus' name we pray. pray. Amen. 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 Okay, let's go back to our seats for a couple more songs, okay? And our praise team again invites you to begin a posture of worship, and we're going to continue offering our praise and worship to God.
celebrate you and worship you. We feel your spirit in this place. We feel it in the friends standing next to us and around us. Lord, we pray that that spirit would speak to us today and draw us closer to you. Not only through the song and the music and the words, but through our love for one another. And this we ask in Jesus' holy name.
You may be seated. So I first want to say that if you came last Sunday, I am sorry, because we tried to get word out, and we will always get word out in every method and way that we can ahead of time. Um, but we always err on the side of caution and safety, and we didn't want anyone to slip in our parking lot or on our sidewalks and end up getting hurt or uh, drive off the road, drive off our driveway into the trees. So we, we went the safe route. You may also be wondering where Pastor Brenda is. She is not caring this morning. She is in Cancun. We're on a beach, and she's all nice and warm. I'm not jealous at all. Um, but she is on vacation, and she is having a wonderful time, and she sends her well wishes and blessings to all of us um, and all of you. But uh, I'm glad that we are able to offer her this time of renewal and um, re-energizing her body, mind, and spirit. Um, just wish I was with her. So <laughs> anyway, she does uh, greet you and wish you well. Um, as you have a moment this morning, I invite you to, to find that registration of attendance pad. It's green. It's either in your row or on a table. Um, I have learned that our service here has not been doing a good job of making sure we sign in. So I want to invite you to do that. And if you are a guest with us this morning, we especially welcome you um, here in our worship uh, together. So this should, last week should have been the second week in our sermon series on greater gifts, but instead today is the second one. Um, don't worry, we'll get in all four in three weeks. So next week will be week three and four, kind of combined together. Um, I was going to attempt to do week two and three today, but it actually, looking at it, three and four work better together. So that's what we're going to do. But we are talking about greater gifts this morning and gifted for others. And you'll, you might remember the last time we gathered, we actually gathered around our baptismal font here, our bowl. And we remembered our baptism together. And do you all remember that? It's been a couple weeks. Okay. Do you still have your shells? Okay. Okay. All right. This is interactive. You can talk back. It's okay. So we remembered our baptism, and we remembered that it is the first gift we received from God and reaffirmed our faith. And now as we move from baptisms and remembering our baptism, we recognize that the gift of baptism is only the beginning. You remember that? That point? All right, okay. We should begin to discover, or if it has been a while, perhaps rediscover our God-given gifts equipping us for a lifelong journey as disciples. We were redeemed for a reason. We are redeemed for a reason. And we are given gifts to fulfill a greater purpose. You may remember that we spent considerable amount of time last fall discussing our gifts, our spiritual gifts, and figuring out what those were or are. And so we're going to remember what those are today if you participated in that last fall. And, and what we're going to touch upon today is how our spiritual gifts are, in fact, gifts for others, and that we need to utilize them in order to fulfill God's purpose for giving us our gifts. And this is all part of our series on God's greater gifts. Just like I mentioned the praise band earlier this morning, Without them, our worship would be kind of dull, and they are utilizing their God-given gifts to enhance our worship and to glorify God. I'm going to read out of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. And if this sounds familiar, it's because we did just hear it um, only a few months ago. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters... I do not want you to be uninformed. 
You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, Let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. May God bless the reading of God's Word this day. Amen. Right away in this passage, we hear that Paul wants us to learn and understand where spiritual gifts come from, the types of gifts, and perhaps most important, that they must be activated by the Holy Spirit. Paul does not want the church to be uninformed. It's an interesting word to have in Scripture. The implication here is that the church in Corinth was struggling with the gift, with an understanding of spiritual gifts. And apparently, the church in Corinth had some people cursing Jesus and claiming they had the spiritual gifts to do so. Paul describes that those two things cannot coexist. Now, before you discount this example from Paul as something we would not understand today, let me ask you this. Have you ever experienced Christians saying or acting out in ways that do not seem to be in line with Jesus? Yeah. Could this also be an example of individuals essentially cursing Jesus and the ways of Jesus by their speech and actions, while at the same time saying they are the followers of Jesus? Nothing says Christian like following someone in traffic who has the what I call the Jesus fish on their bumper, the little Ixus, or um, Jesus is my savior, um, or or God is Lord or whatever on their bumper stickers or on their windows, and then you sit there while they yell and scream and gesture at other people in traffic, and you're like, way to represent, yeah. Not so Christian. What Paul is saying is that's like cursing Jesus. I always just kind of cringe and think, thank God I don't have any of that on my car. That was funny. That was funny. Okay. What if we applied Paul's warning to the ways we speak and act each day. That becomes a little harder, doesn't it? Because it's so much easier to uh, judge others' actions than to reflect on ourselves and how we're doing on a daily basis. I um, try in my day to use the three-hour rule. Um, I wake up at about 6 a.m. every day, and the first thought that goes through my head is, thank you, Jesus, for allowing me to wake up. Dear Jesus, do I really have to wake up? That's usually, if I'm honest, that's usually the, the first thought. And then it goes along the lines of, um, God, help me to be who you need me to be today. Um, God, help me to be your hands and feet today. And then I, and I hit the day running. And so around 9 a.m., I try to pause and I reflect and think, how have I been today? How have I acted today? Am I being 
Jesus today? Am I being the hands and feet and voice of Jesus? And if not, then I try to reset my attitude. And think again. Hey, God, I'm going to re recenter myself, and I'm going to try. And then around lunchtime, around noon, I'll call my husband, and we ask how each other's mornings are going, and sometimes he'll say, I think you might need to reset your attitude. And I'll say, but I'm only like this with you. Um, and then he said, but if you're like this with me, you're probably the same way with the people around you. Um, and so I try to reset then. And then again at 3 and 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. And 9 p.m., the last of the day, that's actually when I do my personal daily devotions and my, my lengthier prayers where I pray for others. And, um, and so at 9 is also a good time for me to ask for forgiveness for all those times during the day that I needed to reset my attitude and didn't. And so, um, you know, I'm human. I don't always get all, every three hours because I don't have, uh, I'm not living in a monastery and I don't have a bell tolling every three hours to remind me um, to, to pause and pray and reflect on my actions and my attitude. But I try. And, um, and I think it's important that we try. In this passage, Paul lists a variety of spiritual gifts for our journey. Utterance of wisdom, utterance of knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, discernment of spirits, various kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. There's even more spiritual gifts listed in other passages. Um, in total, there are four places in the New Testament where we list spiritual gifts. And in that list, it's about 25 to 30 um, that when you combine them all together of spirit gifts. And, and often our spirit gift tests really focus on those 25 to 30, but that is certainly not all the gifts that there are. We can't put limits on the Spirit of God and say, you can only do this, because this is what's only listed in the Bible. Those lists should be seen as representative, not exhaustive. Um, and, and even some of the gifts listed in the New Testament, like administration or leadership, I don't, I don't really first think of those as being spiritual gifts. Do you? You know, I'm good at organizing. Is that a spiritual gift? Um, Marie Kondo people might think so. I have said this before in that, we may be tempted to think our other abilities and talents do not come from the Spirit. Maybe you are talented at computers or carpentry or knitting, but you think, well, that's not a spiritual gift. But all of those talents are given to us by God, and all can be used for the glory of God. What church can't benefit from the skills of a tech-savvy person? Amen? Amen. Casey's back there going, yes, yes, please see me if you have those gifts. Um, or, or carpentry. I mean, if we didn't have the gift of carpentry or people that we have around here, we would be spending a whole lot of money on repair work. And thank, thank God for those that are gifted in those ways, that they offer those to the church. And not just that, they can also, those gifts can also be used as an outreach of the church. In many churches, have ministries making prayer shawls and baby gowns. We have a, a beautiful prayer shawl ministry here. Every gift we have can be used for the glory of God and the building up of the church. Now, activation of your spiritual gift is essential. Activation is putting your gifts into practice for the common good, as Paul calls it, for the common good. What good is a gift if it is never opened or shared for the good of others. Um, anyone have a credit card or two? Yeah? Yes? Yes? And when you get a new credit card, like I do regularly, there's, you open it, and there's always a sticker across it, and it says, call this 800 number to activate, and now sometimes you can just use it to activate it, but regardless, you have to peel that sticker off and call and activate it. I always forget, and then I go to use it, and there's like 10 people in line behind me, and they have to wait while I call the number. Um, am I alone in that? 
I'm sorry if you've been behind me. I'm sorry if you've been behind me or others like me. Um, but you have to activate the card. And, it, and the card's no good unless, you know, just sitting in your wallet, not activated. Next week, um, well, so I wonder why some disciples, us, have gifts and clearly recognize a spiritual gift, but leave it unactivated. And we're going to explore that a little further next week of how not activating our spiritual gifts weakens the community to which we belong. One of my favorite quotes related to discovering and activating our spiritual gifts comes from philosopher, theologian, educator, and civil rights leader Howard Thurman who said, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. The same is true for our spiritual gifts. The world, our church, our community, your family, your workplace, doesn't need you to do tasks for which you are not gifted. The world, our church, our community, your family, your workplace needs you to discern what gifts you have been given and activate them to the fullest for the common good. The world needs more people who have come alive, who have been activated by God's Holy Spirit. These gifts that Paul mentions, there's nothing extraordinary about them. Paul isn't trying to build a super church with super gifts or superbly gifted people. They're really quite ordinary people, much like us. Ordinary people. He talks about wisdom and knowledge, leadership. Okay, he does mention miracles and healings, um, but they are no more important to Paul than prophecy and leadership. He mentions those too. In fact, he doesn't cite anything to the Corinthians that doesn't exist around here in spades. He's writing to the first century church in Corinth, but he is also saying this to every church that bears the name of Jesus in every age, in all places and circumstances. What Paul says applies to us as well. So what is he trying to tell us? He's telling us that we who make up the church are not all exactly alike. Did you know that? And we didn't, you know, it's not like we didn't know that already. We know that. He says that when we bring together our diverse and varied gifts, our unique and individual personalities, and pile them all up together in the same place, we make for community. And in that community, we are united together for one common purpose. So what is it that unites us as people of God? Is it agreement? No. No, Paul doesn't list agreement as one of the criteria for community. And I know this is hard to believe, but did you know we don't all agree on everything? Okay, just making sure. We are not united as a community by our common life experiences. If we were, we could be a church of people who only eat chicken. Or maybe only of beef eaters. Or a church just for vegans. Oh, I smiled at the one vegan I know. <laughs> so look around you, what do you see? You see people who eat all kinds of things, right? Our membership in our community would be very boring and not of God. I see people of all ages, of all backgrounds, coming together with various life experiences for one purpose. And we are not united by those experiences. We may have some similarities here and there, but that's not what makes us community. As Paul says, we have a variety of gifts. So 
Some are good at some things while others are good at doing something else. There is one spirit, Paul says. But when the spirit dispenses gifts to us, they come out varied and different, even if they're kind of similar. You may have the gift of leadership, Tiffany. <laughs> and Dawn may have the gift of leadership. But even that same gift could be seen in a different way and be gifted to you in a very different way. But when we put all of our gifts together, we form community. So what is it, then, that binds us together, that makes us community? Let us understand to the point that there is no doubt whatsoever. Christ is what holds us together. Certainly not our political persuasion or opinions. I've watched your social media. Certainly not our style of worship or even where we worship, nor, nor our denominational allegiance or doctrine. It is Christ and Christ alone who holds us together in a common purpose of worship and ministry. We who are baptized in Christ have a bond that nothing can break. When disagreements come, and they always do, if we will keep our eyes on Christ and love one another in his name, our arguments will dissipate. They will literally fall apart in the light of God's presence. Because that's the important thing. Do you think Paul was naive to believe that such unity is really possible? Perhaps he was. But being naive has nothing to do with it. Having faith in the power that unites people in Christ, on the other hand, has everything to do with it. We are not programmed to have the same thoughts and ideas, to be all alike. We're not robots for God. We aren't. Being community is to keep our eyes, our focus, on the only one thing that truly and ultimately matters. Christ. So let us mark it and mark it well. We are bound together by our devotion in Christ. Nothing else. Nothing else matters. The light of Jesus' presence illuminates our deeds and encourages us to unite in him, even when we disagree. It is the only way to be followers of the one who gave his life for us. It is the only way to live out the promise of our baptism to be the community of Christ. Let us pray. Lord, make us one with you because we have given ourselves unreservedly to the one who has given himself for us. Lord, we continue to pray as a community for one another, for our church, for the, the purpose that you have bound us together and that is simply to tell others about you, to show others who you are, why you matter. Lord, as a community, we lift up our joys this morning for beautiful flowers in the sanctuary from the Blue family in memory of Lauren and for a new birth of Henry Liam Herford of a grandson of Connie Hinton. We lift up joys for successful procedures and for recovery continuing for Leroy Handel, Wayne Horner, Connor Klein, and Walt Winger. Lord, we lift our community's concerns for Billy German's family who recently joined the church triumphant for Roger and Renee Van Dyke, 
for Iveline Seward, and for Amy O. Fulton. Lord, we lift up these and the others that are on our hearts and minds this morning. You know these. You know the needs. And we are grateful that you do. We are grateful that we are not in this world alone. That we have you and the Holy Spirit. And that we have one another. Even if we don't agree. Lord, help us to come alive in you. Help us to seek what it is that makes us come alive. And then to go do it. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I want to uh, invite our hosts to come among us and for us to give back some of those gifts that God has blessed us with in this way, in this time, in a financial form. Um, the church wishes to thank you, though. God wishes to thank you for continuing to be good stewards of both God's gifts and, and what is given. Let us continue our worship.
Church, do you believe? Amen. Amen. We believe. Um, our invitation to Christian discipleship this week uh, has to do with missions. And our missions team uh, this year has decided to do things a little differently. It's the last Sunday of the month, and if you worship with us regularly, we usually introduce our next mission of the month today. But you notice we didn't do that um, because we're doing missions of the quarter. And so this quarter, our focus is on our homeless brothers and sisters in northwest Arkansas. And our youth and children are collecting new socks and underwear. There's a bin right here in the back of the, of the room. There's one also out in the narthex outside the sanctuary. And we're collecting through Valentine's Day. So if you can uh, pick up some socks or underwear while you're out and about in the next few weeks um, to bless our homeless friends, that would be amazing. I also, uh, as your act of discipleship this week, want to encourage you to activate your gifts. Find what makes you come alive and go do it. I invite you to stand as you are able for our closing song, Hallelujah. again. Do you love God? Yes. Do you love Jesus? Yes. Do you love the Holy Spirit? Yes. And do you know that God loves you? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. May you go forth with God's love singing in your soul as you go this week. In the name of our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen.